Now I would like to welcome Eric Chanteau to the stage. 2008 Olympic swimmer, world record holder, 11-time All-American and U.S. national champion, and testicular cancer survivor. Please, a warm welcome to Eric. Thank you all very much for having me here with all of you today. Um, with all this talk about the Olympics, it's gotten me really, really excited. And I am here today to tell you uh, about my Olympic story. But it starts a very, very long time ago. But before I get into that, I want to share a quote from Booker T. Washington. And he said that success is not defined by the number of victories you achieve, but by the mountains you overcome. And keeping that in mind, 50 years from now, when I'm no longer wearing the Speedos that I'm wearing today, <laughs> when I look back on my swimming career, I can almost guarantee that I'm not going to remember the races that I won. The records that I have will be long gone from the books. But what I will remember is the experience, is the journey that I went through to achieve all those things. And part of that journey was going through cancer and the experience that I gained going through that and the person that it has made me today. And that person is standing before you willing to talk straight and openly about cancer. That's what I believe in. I think that's the biggest weapon we have in the fight against cancer is to be open and honest about it. So all that being said, when people ask me how long I've been swimming, I can legitimately say it's been my entire life. <laughs> the early years needed a little bit of work. So I had to start training, which also, also started at a very early age. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, I, I learned to swim when I was three years old. My parents took me to one of our neighbor's pools where they taught little kids how to swim. And it really took off from there. I started the swim team when I was five. And by the time I was 10 years old, I had gotten pretty serious with the sport, or as serious as you can get. Now, when I was 10 years old, I had a problem. They wouldn't let me swim as far as I wanted to. So I had to race with the older guys. And I'm not talking about the 11, 12-year-olds or the 13 and 14-year-olds. I'm talking about the senior age group. So here I am as a 10-year-old racing against guys that are a little bigger, to say the least. <laughs> and I was able to do the 200s of the strokes, which they, which they wouldn't let the 9 and 10-year-olds do. I was able to do events like the 400 IM, which they wouldn't let younger kids do. So this was how I got my start in racing. And when I was 10 years old, I was lucky enough in one of these races to break the state record in the 100 IM. And this was the trophy I got. And looking back on it now, this trophy was the catalyst for my entire career. This trophy that I got with this record allowed me to go to the Georgia All-Star Banquet. And the speaker that day was Janet Evans. And Janet Evans is still widely regarded as probably the best female distance swimmer ever to compete. And we were in a banquet hall about this size. I think there were about 800 other swimmers there that day. And at the end of her speech, she looks out across the crowd and she says, somebody in this room is going to represent the United States on the biggest stage in the world. Somebody in this room is going to race in the Olympics. Is that person going to be you? And little 10-year-old me, sitting all the way back in the corner, thought to myself, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be an Olympic swimmer. So from that moment on, when everyone asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up, I would always say, I want to be an Olympic swimmer. And that's what I trained to be. Every day when I got back into the pool, I thought about the Olympics. I thought about competing at the Olympic trials. I thought about racing in the Olympic Games. The first opportunity I had to do that was in the year 2000, when I was 16 years old. The Olympic trials were at Indianapolis. Uh, that's where the Swimming Hall of, Hall of Fame wall is, I should say. And like the picture you saw before, 
being 16, I was the second youngest guy at Olympic trials. Now, if you notice on the scoreboard, the name that's in front of me in 11th, <laughs> he was the youngest guy at Olympic trials. So I've been racing him for a long, long time. But like the picture I just showed you guys, being 16 at Olympic trials, you're racing against the country's best. You're racing against college athletes. You're racing against professional athletes. So I was totally intimidated. But it was the first time that I ever got to race on the national stage. And what I took from that meet was I'm better than I thought I was. I just had to believe it, and I had to know it. And after the 2000 trials, I walked away with that experience that I can do great things. I just have to truly believe in them. In four years, I want to come back to this meet, and I want to be a major player. I want to make the Olympic team. So before the 2004 trials came up, I decided to attend college at Auburn University. And the four years that I spent at Auburn were some of the best four years of my swimming career. I was able to be a part of four national championship teams at Auburn, where we also collected four SEC titles. And about halfway through, after my sophomore year of my time at Auburn, the 2004 Olympic trials came up. And this was where I actually encountered my first major hurdle of my career. Now, the 2004 Olympic trials were in Long Beach, California. First big outdoor meet I'd ever been to. And when I say big, it was big. And this was the first time I'd raced in front of a crowd of over 10,000 people. So I was a little bit nervous, to say the least. And if you know anything about Olympic trials, you know that it doesn't matter how fast you are before that meet. It doesn't matter the records you have, the medals you've won. You have to get first or second at Olympic trials to make the Olympic team, plain and simple. So I go into the 2004 Olympic trials kind of a dark horse. I wouldn't say that I was a favorite to make the team, but I was definitely one of the guys who had a chance. The first day of the meet, the first event up for me is the 400 IM. It's the marathon of swimming. I call it the marathon and not the mile because I think it's the hardest event. That's just me personally. But the first day is the most brutal event. And what was difficult about it was right out of the gate, you've got a four and a half minute race that's going to kick your butt. Okay. When that race ended, I hit the wall, I turn around and I look at the clock. I see my time is incredible. I just dropped a whole bunch of time. And then I look at my place. And I got third, which I was like, man, that's tough. I just missed the Olympic team. Who got second? And I looked at the second place finisher, and he'd only beaten me by about seven tenths of a second in a four and a half minute race. So I was like, wow, that was really close. But I'm OK. My best event is coming up. It's 200 IM. So I had a couple days off. And as the 200 IM came up, prelims went by great. Semifinals went by great. I'm qualified second going into finals. Why can't we just stop now? I'm on the Olympic team. <laughs> and as finals lined up, I'm in lane five. Uh, Michael is in lane four. Ryan Lochte is in lane three. And uh, Kevin Clements is in lane six. So the race, really, for the Olympic team is probably going to come down to those four lanes. And I remember taking a peek over to my right about halfway through the race. I'm sitting on Michael's hip, which is a good place to sit if you can be that close to him. And I, I like where I'm at. And so I continued to swim my race hit the wall with everything I had. I turned around. The first thing I do is look at my place. And I see another three next to my name. And this time, it was by only about two tenths of a second. So I was devastated. I missed the 2004 Olympic team in two different events by fractions of a second. And the hardest part about the 2004 trials was going on and watching the Olympics on TV and seeing both those guys win gold and silver in both those events. So I knew I was good enough to swim on the biggest stage in the world. I knew I was good enough to race at the Olympics. I knew I was good enough to compete for medals. I just had to make it. That's the hardest part about being a swimmer in the US is actually making those national teams. So after 2004, I took some time off. I came back to the sport with a new hunger. I graduated from Auburn in 2006. And I made the choice to move to Austin, Texas. So I have some Texas roots about me. And I spent the next four and a half years training with Eddie Reese at the University of Texas. The first thing Eddie does is tell me, Eric, you're no longer an IAMer. You're going to be a breaststroker. And I looked at him like he was crazy. 
But having at that time the best breaststroker in the world as a training partner turned out to be a really, really good thing. So we forgot about IM and we focused on breaststroke. Now leading up to the 2008 trials in Omaha, and again this was a record for me in front of about 15 or 16,000 people, I was feeling really, really good. Everything was going great. My training was perfect. My mentality was perfect. Everything was set for me to make the Olympic team in 2008. And then about two weeks out from the trials, I'm laying in bed one night, and I feel something that I didn't think should be there. So with the encouragement of my then girlfriend, who is now my wife, she looks at me and she says, I don't care what it takes. You get it figured out. You see what's wrong with you. You're not allowed to go any longer. Get to a doctor. So I go to a general care physician, and after about a week of seeing different specialists, having different testing done, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer on June 19th of 2008. I was leaving for the Olympic trials on June 26th. So this was bad timing. And I will never forget when I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and he looks at me and he says, Eric, you've got cancer. And he immediately starts laying out this battle plan to essentially save your life. And being a professional swimmer, I had control over everything in my life. I controlled how I train, where I train, what I race, what I eat, you name it, it was my control. All of a sudden, this doctor who I just met has ripped the control out of my hands. And he's telling me what I need to do to live. And after explaining my situation, he said, well, you can swim at trials, you can delay treatment for a couple weeks, but if you make the team, you're probably not going to be able to go. Good luck. <laughs> So that's what I went to trials with. I didn't tell anyone. Um, uh, my, my family and friends knew, and that was about it. And my biggest chance to make the Olympic team in Omaha was the 200 breaststroke. And just like 2004, prelims went by great. Semifinals went by great. I qualified second going into finals. It's like a mirror image almost. And thankfully enough, when I finished the 200 breaststroke and I turned around and I looked up to that scoreboard, I saw a two next to my name, and I had finally made the Olympic team. And I will never forget seeing that two next to my name and just having the absolute relief. But at the same time, knowing that I didn't know if I could actually compete at the games because I had cancer. So now the really tricky part came up. I wanted to swim at the Olympics. But having testicular cancer, it's an aggressive form of cancer, no matter what type of testicular cancer you have. So I gathered my army of doctors, we sat down, and we had some decisions to make. Can you delay treatment another six weeks to compete at the Olympic Games? And even if you do, are you going to be physically 100% to compete at the Olympic Games? So they put together a battle plan, which included a battery of testing that I was going to do every week in order to stay on the Olympic team and compete at the Games. Now this story got kind of big a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. And before we decided to go public with it, I had a conversation with my dad, who at that time had been battling his stage 4 lung cancer for a little over a year. And he told me, Eric, it's simple. You have a decision to make. Either cancer has you or you have it. And he told me that after living with his disease for a little over a year and not having a light at the end of his tunnel, he made the decision that he was going to still do the things he wanted to do. He was going to live the way he wanted to live. He wasn't going to get, let cancer live his life for him. So that's when I made the decision, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. If I can, I'm going to pass these tests, and that's all I'm going to think about. After that, I'm going to concentrate on swimming, and I'm going to swim at the Olympic Games if my body lets me. So fortunately enough, I was able to go to Beijing where I encountered a whole bunch of media. And the way I dealt with it was a sense of humor. And this was the only interview my dad ever did. And we, uh, we did the Today Show together in Beijing. And, and the press would ask me, you know, one, one of the first questions out of their mouth was, well, Eric, are you crazy? And I'm like, no, but I'm going half nuts. <laughs> and. <laughs> And so the, the shirt, I, I had a couple t-shirts that I would wear at the games. And um, just to kind of express how I was feeling that day. And the first one you just saw uh, just said, cancer sucks real big on the front. And that was actually a coach 
a, a shirt that belonged to my coach who lost his batter battle with colon cancer. And his wife gave that to me in, in support of my fight. The other shirt I had was given to me by one of my sponsors at the time. And across the front, it said, I'd kick cancer in the nuts. So that was, again, the, the way I kind of dealt with it. Um, so uh, you know, all that being said, with all the press and everything else, I still had to compete at the Olympics. And um, I actually finished competing at the Olympics in semifinals. I didn't make it through to the finals. And that's why I don't have the most happy look on my face. Um, but when it was all said and done, I had raced on the biggest stage in the world. I had gone a personal best time faster than I ever had before. And I had done it all with cancer. So I was pretty happy about that. I really couldn't argue with not making the final and getting a chance to go for, the, for an Olympic medal. Now this was my reality six days after I got home from the Olympic Games. I went from competing on the biggest stage in the world to being wheeled into surgery uh, six days after I got back. And um, this was the most scared I have ever been in my life because all the indecisions were going through my head. You know, Because I left it in my body for so long, what if it had spread? What if it's someplace else? And um, this was a, a very difficult time for me. But uh, a few weeks after surgery, I was declared cancer-free cancer on September 15th of 2008 and have been clean and clear since that day and actually just passed my uh, surveillance tests in April that will clear me for the summer. So keep your fingers crossed, assuming nothing else comes up. <laughs> I will be good to compete for this summer. Now, I had so much help during the summer of 2008 that I felt like I had to do something to give back. I had to be able to, at least in some way, tell people my story, let them know the support that I had, the outreach that I had. And my can care, so to speak, uh, partner was a guy named Drew Dunworth, who was um, a cancer survivor himself back in the 80s. He is 30 years older than I am, so we didn't quite have that in common. But he was the one who guided me through the experience, who really uh, put things into perspective for me. And, and he gave me an unemotional response and answer to everything. My dad was great, but my dad had emotional ties. I was his son. So it was great to talk to someone like Drew. I had, he wasn't an official can care person, but um, I had that support system. And so with all that support that I had, I decided to get back in the water. And lo and behold, for some reason, I came back way faster after cancer. I don't know how it happened. Um, I, I like grew a half an inch and put on 10 pounds of muscle when I was 25 years old, which didn't make much sense. This was my reality 10 months after going through surgery. Uh, the World Championships in 2009, I became a two-time world record holder and I became a world record holder and a world champion on the 4 by 100 meter medley relay. And this is probably the best swimming experience I've ever had, was standing on this medal podium with three of my very good friends. We had just shattered the world record. I'd won my first world title. And I can tell you, there was no greater experience in my swimming career, this beat making the Olympic team, than when they come up, they put that gold medal around your neck, and you stand there at attention with your flowers, and you actually can't see them, but they give you a weird little stuffed animal when you win. I don't know why. <laughs> Our, ours was a space frog. You can tell we're all hiding them behind our back. But, uh, and, and they put that gold medal around your neck, and they start to play the national anthem, and you're standing there at attention while the national anthem plays, and your flag goes up above everyone else's, and they flash on the huge jumbotron your picture with new world record underneath it in huge bold letters. And I thought to myself for an instant, I was like, wow, a year ago I had cancer, and now I'm standing here the fastest in history. This is pretty cool. And, you know, it, it all goes back to what my dad told me. Either you have cancer or it has you. And I decided that it didn't have me. I decided that I was going to live the way I wanted to. I decided that I was going to have control over what I did in life. And my dad uh, lost his battle a year later. Um, I actually got a call the night of um, the night I won my fifth national title in the 200 breaststroke. I got a call from my mom telling me that I needed to come home, that dad didn't have very much longer. 
So I raced home, and um, the last few days we spent together were some of, I think, the most important days we had because it was trying to get a lifetime of advice in in a couple days. And one of the things he told me was, keep doing the things that make you happy, but also don't ever give up the fight. And please stay involved with what you've started and see it out. So I'm here with all of you today because I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to give up. I won't leave this fight. I'll do it for as long as I need to. And that's something that I take very seriously and feel very passionately about. And I want to thank all of you for being here today because you are showing your support for a program that provides invaluable resources to cancer survivors and cancer patients. You guys are here in support of your family and your friends and your loved ones that have cancer or have gone through cancer. So thank you so much for supporting programs like this and continuing to do so and continuing to stay involved in the fight. Because I'm not going anywhere. I know you guys aren't going anywhere. We're going to be here as long as we need to be. Hopefully it won't be too much longer. What's next for me? Hopefully this summer I'll be in London. My trials are coming up in a month. I have uh, trials on June 25th is when they start. They're back in Omaha. Assuming all goes well there, I will compete uh, in London and go for the one thing that has eluded me throughout my career, and those are Olympic medals. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, that's where I'll be over the next six to eight weeks. I would appreciate all of your support. And I know for those of you who watched the Olympics on TV in 2008, I know you were screaming at the TV, especially when Jason Lezak ran down the Frenchman on the relay. <laughs> so you guys keep doing that. Please keep supporting your, our Olympic athletes. We appreciate everything. We can hear you screaming, so keep it up. Thank you all for having me here today.